Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hmm. Stephanie Mock, huh? <laughs> That's my name. All right. She's the host of Food and Farmer. So what is she doing here today on a given Tuesday? She's going to talk about Japan yeah. and her trip to Japan. We want to know yeah. more about it's that. It's not Think Tech Hawaii today, it's Think Tech Asia. So. There you go, Think Tech Asia, yeah. here we are. So nice of you to come down and tell us about your trip. Thank you for inviting me. I know it's our, our show's going to be a little bit different today than what I'm used to, talking yeah, it's, about it's food okay. and farmers. It's all right. Yeah. I'm curious to see where you lead me, Jay. Well, I may ask you about your perception okay. of things in Japan when it comes to you know, I gotta tell you a short story. When I arrived on, on these, in these islands, October 1st, 1965, before your mother was born, mm -hmm. um, my boss, as soon as I walked in the door, my boss said to me, you can't possibly live here and understand Hawaii until you go to Japan. Mm -hmm. Because Japan is the sort of the, the cultural source for so much in Hawaii, mm -hmm. how can you not go? And he ordered me to go and do nothing but travel around in Japan. Which, which I was happy to do. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed, I, I, I stayed at Tachikawa Air Force Base, okay. which is near you know, Tokyo. One of the things I noticed is that there were a lot of agriculture in that neighborhood, but they were using human, human uh, nutrients ah, okay. <laughs> for the agriculture. And I, this is 1965, it was 20 years after the war, so yeah. things were different. Before environmental regulations. Before anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you went, and, and you went recently, mm -hmm. and so you're fresh back, and we want to know everything. We want to know the gestalt of your trip, as <laughs> nobody has ever seen Japan, Stephanie. Oh my gosh, you're building oh this God, up so yeah. much. An American lady goes to Japan. Yes. Okay, so the first thing is, why? Well, um, the, ultimately, the reason I went was because AirAsia was offering these super cheap fares to Osaka. And to be honest, the, the price kind of excluded me from traveling. You know, we know Hawaii is really expensive, right? Even doing a staycation can cost hundreds, even thousands of dollars. And so the idea of traveling to a foreign country and spending that amount of money plus an extra thousand dollars for airfare seemed insane, especially as a single woman living here in Hawaii. Um, and then I got a round trip flight for $200. Wow. So even if the food is expensive or accommodation, I'm like, $200? How you can you say yeah, no? Yeah. Yeah, that's like a flight to Hilo sometimes, you know? So, um, so nine-hour trip there, and I was like, of course, I just have to go because this price is so cheap. It's really a great bar. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you go. You decide you go. Need a visa? No visa, you get a visa there as an American citizen. It's very um, simple. I, I'm laughing because I... Whenever you're doing a visa or a border run, it get, I always have some nerves of like, oh, the, the agents are going to be like, no, you're denied entry, especially when you get a visa on site, right? You're like, I'm here, please let me enter. And they give you a nice little stamp and they're like, enjoy. And I, it was so simple. It was harder to get back into the United States than it was to get a visa to Okay, Japan. that's point number one on the exam. <laughs> it was harder to get back in the United yeah. States than it was to get into Japan in the yeah. first place. Mm -hmm. What has changed in our lives? <laughs> Feeling patriotic today, the day before July 4th? Of course, I have to feel patriotic on July 4th. Yeah. Um, I think traveling the world sometimes can make you either feel super patriotic or it can make you feel that maybe our country can take the lessons and ideas from other cultures and apply it to ourselves as well. So, there's a tipping point there. Hmm. So which way do you tip after this trip? <laughs> um, I'm not a politician. I feel like I don't have all these diplomatic answers. Um, I would say I encourage everyone to travel internationally as much as possible because ultimately the exchange of ideas is going to help everyone's society in the long term. Yes. Yes, you have to go. You have to see. You have to make the comparison. Mm -hmm. You have to bring back uh, cultural arbitrage, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's the value of it. It's not just personal education. Right. You're a, you're an emissary. You're a citizen diplomat. Mm -hmm. When you go, you bring America, whatever it is, with right. the slings and arrows. And when you come back, you bring the benefit of, of mm -hmm. having seen things that maybe you like more. Right. Yeah. And when I travel, especially as an American, you know, I I I've been very fortunate in my life to travel to Europe and travel to, um, I used to live in Southeast Asia, um, and they don't get to meet a lot of Americans that they may necessarily like. Um, 
as a general stereotype, we tend to be louder, a little bit like a lot of bravado. Um, so as a, as a single solo American female traveling, I kind of give them a different perspective of America, maybe not all this male bravado and we're number one type thing in the world. And they get to see, you know, that there are so many Americans out there who want to learn about other cultures and we hope that other people can visit us as well. Yeah, yeah. You look at it, I hate to talk about age, but you, you look at it from the point of view of a millennial, yeah? Mm. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. It's all right to be a millennial. Yeah. Yeah. Millen uh, I feel like millennial when it's said by someone of an older generation is usually a derogatory term. Oh, you millennials and your yeah. avocado toast, all that crazy stuff. So <laughs> I see it as you know, millennials are just the next generation showing how we can move forward in the future. Yeah, I'm one too state of mind. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you go there and, and you're a single lady traveling mm -hmm. alone. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a, a kind of a mental framework to deal with that. So mm -hmm. what is your, you know, what is your state of mind as yeah. you go through a foreign country mm -hmm. that you haven't been to before right. um, as a single lady? See that, you know, this is somewhat intimidating, I suppose, but maybe not in Japan, eh? Yeah. So again, I've been really fortunate. I'm an only child, so I cite I'm usually traveling alone as a child, just getting used to the world. Um, and so traveling alone doesn't scare me. I have enough street smarts to be like, let's not throw a thousand dollars, have a thousand dollars in my hand and walk down the street type thing. Um, so, but there is always that mindset. But even here living in Hawaii or even on mainland US, as a woman, you are carrying your keys in between your hands. You're wary of men on the street at night. Um, so going to Japan, it wasn't really going to be that any different because I already deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I got to Japan, I was it is the safest country I've ever been to in my entire life. I've been to 20 countries. And I've lived in the U.S. most of my life, and I felt safer there even walking out at 3 a.m. by myself than I ever have anywhere else in the world. And it was, it was a really nice feeling because for me, I had this moment of like, is this what every man feels like when they walk down the street of like, yeah, I can just walk down and no one's going to catcall me or bother me or try, you know, anything like that. So, and Japan's super safe. Their police officers don't even have guns. Like, they're just walking around weaponless. And it blew my mind that you can have such um, a respect for authority in that sense that your police officers don't even have guns and people will still follow laws. Yeah, nice. That, that's a great realization in yeah. Japan. And, and then people are friendly, they're, they're mm -hmm. cooperative, they're courteous to a fault. Yeah. They take care of you, they, they want to welcome you, all of them, all the time, am I yeah. right? Yeah. I, yeah, usually I feel like here in America, like when you go visit someone, you like argue about like, no, I got dinner, no, you, no, no, I, I'll pay. And I tried to do that in Japan and it was seen as an insult, like how dare you offer to pay, you're a visitor in my country, because of that um, culture of hospitality, right? Like you've come to Japan, we want to share this experience with you, we don't want you to be like tied down by finances, like here's sake, try some sushi, let's go here. And I'm like, please, can I give you like five dollars? They're like, no! Um, <laughs> And I was, you know, we always talk about in, uh, especially in Hawaii tourism, that sense of aloha and hospitality, right? And it was really nice to go to Japan, like you said, one of the cultural sources um, of local culture here and see that same sort of aloha or hospitality shown as well. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Okay, you took some pictures. I took some pictures. 27 pictures. Well, actually, lots more than well, that. Well, I really took like 4,000 4, photos. 4,000 pictures. So when Very you gave me the mandate place. of 10 photos, that was quite a large endeavor. So and you I stuck was like, in 27. Yeah, so, well, yeah. So um, I thought maybe I could give a little bit of background of where I traveled first, since the pictures are just kind of miscellaneous. Yeah, okay. um, so I flew into Osaka, and I stayed there for a couple days just to acclimate and, like, get used to the culture there. And then I went to um, Kyoto. Then I went um, all the way north to Morioka to visit my Japanese friend, Mami, who's my best friend. Um, I've known her for five years. And she and I always traveled together. We went backpacking together. And then I came back to Tokyo, back to Kyoto, back to Osaka. So I basically went all the way north and then came back all the way south. 
What a trip. Wow, yeah. you're so, how long were you away? I was there for two and a half weeks, um, backpacking the whole time. But really what made it possible to see all that stuff in two and a half weeks was their amazing infrastructure in terms of rail. So uh, they have the Shinkansen, the bullet train, which is uh, uh, high speed rail, right? Which I know rail is a huge discussion here that we have at Think Tech Hawaii about um, the finances and all the applicability of it here in Hawaii. But in Japan, with a whole country's network of infrastructure um, that's maintained really well, it makes it possible for people to travel within the country without breaking the bank. Yeah. Yeah. How about hotels? Did you stay at Japanese inns or those little those little pods? I they stayed had? in the little pods. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you call them? They're called capsule dorms. We have a photo here, okay. actually, <laughs> um, and it may look like a coffin. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> the first one I got in, I was like, oh no, because I do have a little bit of claustrophobia. You know, when I get in elevators, I am slightly aware of the space. Um, but because Japan was such a sensory overload for me, you know, language, food, um, just different people's personalities and stuff like that, it was really nice to come back to a little cave um, that's dark and your own space. Um, and and the, the interesting thing I found about Japanese dorms, which are not true for any other dorms I've ever been to in my life, is that there's no talking. Oh. So usually, you know, in a, a German dorm or if you go to a dorm in Thailand, everyone's on their bunk beds. They're like, oh, hey, Jay, where are you going? Where are you from? Like, what do you do? And that's how you make friends and you make those connections. But in Japan, it's no talking. There's signs everywhere, no talking. And this was in every single dorm I went to throughout the country. And I made the cultural faux pas of one time talking on my phone for five minutes at 11 a.m. And they were like, shh. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I figured, you know, 11 a.m., everyone's fine. But I was like, oh, it's a cultural thing of no speaking at all. And I think the idea is that because, because the cities are so dense and crowded and you don't really have that space of your own, really, that when you, you do have this small capsule dorm, this is your space, and you're not going to let anyone impede on that, either by sound or just coming into your oh, space as well. that's a lovely idea, isn't it? Yeah. A, little, a little peaceful quiet. It's just like, okay, it may be small, but at least it's mine, and no one can touch it and reach it. Okay, we're touching so much on the photos. Let's start going okay. through them, all right? Okay, yeah. So tell us about each photo, what we would not be able to guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, maybe, Ray, could you pull up any photo you like? Okay, so here I am in Morioka. Uh, I'm with my best friend, Mommy. She really helped make my trip of delight because she connected me with so many local experiences and we're here um, eating yakitori so we have that here as well just basically skewers of meat every type of meat I had intestines um, she called it chicken butt which I thought was adorable um, and we just ate basically everything any sort of meat product you could get from chicken to cattle anything like that we ate it was good it was so good um, as you can see in this photo I'm the only foreigner there um, which it just is so nice because no one treated me like a foreigner. Huh. They were nice to me, but they weren't like, oh, like, where are you from? And they just like let mommy and I have a really nice night out. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Okay. What's next? So uh, this is mommy. So okay. I want to tell, I want a quick story about her. I met her in a dorm in Thailand five years ago. And through the magic or power of social media, we've been able to keep in touch. She visits me here in Hawaii. We backpack around. And so I had the chance to see her in Japan, in her home country. And the reason I wanted to highlight her was because she literally lit up a network of friends around the country to be like, my friend Stephanie's in town. Go take her for sushi. Or like, oh, my friend Stephanie's in Kyoto. She paved the way for you. Yeah, oh, she really helped. Great. And yeah. so, you know, those international friendships we're talking about, like not only can help our society but on an individual level like I don't think my trip would have been as amazing if it weren't for her and like the hospitality that she yeah, showed yeah and you'll see them again oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah for great. sure prepare for visitors <laughs> yeah really um oh this is a so in osaka just outside osaka there is the instant ramen museum and they show you the first cup of noodles ever made to like all the different varieties and here the photo we're looking at it looks like a bar right it looks like a salad bar yeah, yeah. you make your own cup of noodles so i'm making my own cup of noodles here you get to choose your broth these are all different you have egg toppings garlic chips shrimp and you get to choose toppings and make your own cup of noodles. And that was, 
You know, everyone else was like, what a nerd. But I grew up on instant noodles. Um, and so that was just like so nostalgic and so neat at the same time. Yeah. Great. OK, what do we got? Uh, oh, more okay. food. So yeah, so I grew up on instant ramen, but I also grew up on pickles. I am a pickle fiend. Um, and this is a market in Kyoto called Nishiki Market. And it's, it's just a really long alleyway of just these mom and pop stores. And they were famous for their pickles. So these are literally all pickles. Everything you see in this photo, you have pickled asparagus, gourds, radishes, you know, daikon. Um, and I was just like, what? So I had pickled eggplant, which was my favorite. And I brought some home so I can eat it as well. Yeah. So just these little moments. Oh, gosh. Oh, it's all I think, about food. I think our producer <laughs> likes food, um, as, as do I. So this was my absolute favorite thing I ate in Japan. Yeah. It's um, cherry blossom ice cream. Okay. So you know the famous cherry blossoms that everyone goes to Japan to yeah. see? They've just utilized that and made it into an ice cream. It's and actual it, cherry blossoms. It's actual cherry blossoms. <laughs> it was... I was like, this is going to taste like flowers, right? Like, it's going to taste really fake, and it was... Amazing, and I did. I wanted to get a second one, but I was like, I think one ice cream cone is enough. But that was it my favorite like a thing. Cherry taste? No, it just was like. Oh, what, I wish I were a chef. It was just like this very light kind of spring taste. Not um, too sweet. Yeah, and it didn't taste like a fake flowery. I yeah. thought it was going to be like perfumey a little bit, but yeah. it was so light and nice. Yeah, that would justify the whole trip for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> what else? Okay, oh, before okay. and so, after, maybe? So in Tokyo, you have Shibuya Crossing. It's a really famous crossing for tourists to see. And the reason is this is the most um, popular or populous intersection in the world. Three million people a day traverse this intersection. So right here, I'm showing just a general photo of what it looks like when people aren't crossing. Um, and maybe if we could pull up the video of showing the people crossing. Um, in Shibuya. So this isn't even this isn't even at rush hour or anything. And three million people like a day. All day long. Yeah. So I titled it one of the greatest animal migrations in the world. We think <laughs> wildebeest on the savanna, but we also have human <laughs> human migrations as well. And so Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo is one of those places. You want to ask Stephanie a question? Call in 808-374-2014. All right. Hard questions are permitted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, you know the thing about it is um, that that um, this countryside as well as cities. Mm. And I wonder if you got out into the country and saw, you know, the beautiful scenes that yeah. exist in Japan. Yeah. Mount Fuji, for example. Well, I didn't go to Mount Fuji because I couldn't drive there, um, but I did go hiking with my friend Mami up north. So imagine where Tokyo is if you take a bullet train three hours north of that. So I'm really far north up in Sendai. And we went hiking um, oh, yeah. at uh, Mount Akita. I can't remember the name. I could look it up. Como Fugate or something like that. Okay. But it's basically volcanic. It almost looks like Iceland, right? Um, you have this black volcanic soil. You have, um, <laughs> I think your phone's coming off. They have snow and bamboo. Um, and it was just amazing. And she, there's some scenes where, you know, a bunch of snow and fog. It looks something out of a nature documentary. Um, and living at sea level, I have acclimated to sea level, and we were maybe, we weren't that high, maybe a thousand meters, and I was just starting to be like, like, I am so out of shape, like, I can't really hike anymore. <laughs> and she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, you're fat. And I'm like, no, like, something's wrong. And then it finally, I was like, I feel like I can't really the breathe. Thing. Yeah, I was starting to get a little bit of altitude sickness, but. You know, Japan has been through, through some natural disasters, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, the tidal waves and, and, uh, and of course, the whole Fukushima business. Right. Um, did you worry about that? Did you talk to people about it? Hmm. What was the sense of vulnerability to things like that? Well, I wouldn't say there is like an air of vulnerability. You would see tsunami signs. You know, this is a tsunami evacuation area. Um, and actually, I left, and the next day they had a 6.2 earthquake in Osaka. Oh, wow. um, it was because of your departure. It was, yeah, <laughs> I was upset, you know. But unfortunately, you know, that even th this earthquake, it unfortunately killed three people. Um, and that was mostly due to like walls falling on them and stuff like that. But the biggest 
you know, besides their unfortunate passing was the train stations. How do you deal with people on trains during an earthquake, oh, yeah. right? Um, but there wasn't a sense of, in, you know, impending doom all the time. And, you know, living here in Hawaii, we went through, like, a false nuclear alarm. So, you know, it doesn't really matter where you are. Like, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster can really happen anywhere. Yeah, true. Yeah. <clears throat> and speaking of which, <clears throat> did you talk to people about North Korea? Because it was yeah. only a few weeks earlier that North Korea was a real threat. Yeah. I didn't feel comfortable talking to people about that, um, but I wish I had brought this picture. There were a lot of newspapers with uh, Kim Jong-un's face everywhere, and, you know, I this wonder... This was before the meeting or after the meeting with both, Trump? Both, both. Oh. Um, and so I was like, you know, even though I can't read Japanese, like, I wonder what they're talking about in their yeah, newspapers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't feel comfortable personally on, an, uh, on a personal level because... Like I said, I am not a politician, I am not a diplomat, anything like that. This means so. you should probably run for office, Stephanie. Because I say I'm not a politician? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and, you know, America doesn't have the greatest PR right now. Um, and so I didn't feel comfortable trying to challenge that outwardly. Um, I'd rather my, my actions and my kindness show a different way that, you know, Americans... We, we are good people. We can be yeah. good people. The, the kind and gentle American. Yeah, as opposed to like, we're awesome, we're <laughs> nice, you should listen to me, you know? Like, let your actions speak for themselves. Did they speak to you about their views of Trump and, and Kim Jong-un and what have yeah. you, the American change? Yeah, so uh, quick backstory. I went to Switzerland when George W. Bush, I was like 14 or 15 when George W. Bush got elected. And I remember my dad and I were on the streets one time, and there was like these drunk revelers in Switzerland, and they started berating us because we were American and we're idiots and whatever. That's when you tell them you're Canadian. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I was, I was Japanese people. I knew were super nice. I knew no one was going to do that, and I fully expected more playful teasing about it and I only got it once just like hmm just like we know who your president is and yeah, that was all yeah. um, and I think that's just because they're kind and they also recognize that I don't have control over international right. policy right, right? right. right. so right they saw I me? had the same experience yeah. in Iceland a few weeks ago oh yeah you know because I wanted to find out what people were thinking about Trump and mm -hmm. all that and they really wouldn't tell me, but they, what I got was this kind of shrug the shoulder kind of right. reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're sorry for you, but we're not going to talk about exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because they recognize that, you know, we want to be progressive, right? And we want to continue to move forward. And that you alone, Jay, cannot control all of the right. international policy right. and domestic policy. Right. Right. So. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. well, let's go back to pictures. Okay. What do we got now? Yeah. <clears throat> So this is me in Shinjuku in Tokyo, some of the nightlife, just all the crazy neon lights. In my, before I went, I thought it was like one alley, like I just thought it was like one street, oh, you no. know? Yeah. And, and then I was like, oh, this whole neighborhood is lit up by, so this isn't even like a main street, this is like a side street. Um, and I was just, a I just, I kept imagining energy bills. Like, you know, in Hawaii, we could never really have this. Um, one, because of like light pollution and stuff, but also just the amount of energy or the price it would cost to light those yeah, would yeah. be insane. Yeah, 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 yeah. See it in other places in Asia too, yeah. for example, yeah. China, yeah. yeah. What else? Uh, the photo behind us actually is a, like a, a garden I went to. It was amazing. It was this temple in Kyoto and it was raining. And so that's why you see no people in the photo because when it rains, people don't want to go outside. And yeah. that's when I don my rain jacket. I'm like, I'm going out and getting some photos of yeah. these picturesque places, including um, this scene in Kyoto. So these are two girls who uh, are wearing kimono and they're actually doing a photo shoot right now. They're just... Uh, there's so many teenage Japanese girls who did this, um, but it made for lovely photos for themselves, but for myself as well. So if you just stay in one spot, usually you'll catch a great photo. It's kind so of picturesque. Like the, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the shades, the colors, in this case, the kimono. Yeah. <clears throat> so what about the language? Were you able to understand everybody speak English? Um, a lot of people would speak English or they would do like miming. Um, I never expected anyone to speak English, so I learned some key words. Um, just like, excuse me, like sumimasen, like sorry, if you just like nod and say that. It I takes, like the way you did yeah, that. Yeah, it takes, <laughs> it takes you really far. I think um, the 
one of the most unique phrases I learned was so. Uh, Japanese like customer service in stores, they wrap everything like seven, eight times. Um, and here in Hawaii, in the mainland, we're we're trying to go towards reusable bags, right? Yeah. So like to go to this culture, which is also an island, you're like, oh, surely they'll be like more progressive, I guess. Yeah. Um, with like this homogenous culture, and then no, let's put it in paper and plastic and another plastic and bag that's taped. And I was like. I'm at 7-Eleven buying a drink, like, so I just learned like sono mama, which means like as it is, like, so they would just give you the drink as oh, opposed to wrapping it. they're willing to do that. Yeah, and when I would say it, they would think I was uh, fluent, and they'd be like, blah, 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 like starting talking to me, and I'm like, D you know, deer in the headlights, like, uh, and then they're like, like, here you go. <laughs> so. so did you see, I mean, you know, living in Hawaii, you see threads, mm -hmm. little little pieces of Japanese culture yeah. all over. Were there things there in Japan that remind you? Did you find, um, you know, the root of yeah. the culture? Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. I think, so, you know, I've worked in the tourism sector here, and I never, like, Japanese tourists are super nice, but I never really, like, fully understood them. Um, you know, all the, like, bowing and all the kind of stuff like that. And then traveling there, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. So, like, for example, here in Hawaii, yeah, you'll go hiking and you'll see these like beautiful Japanese women all dolled up with their high heels, and you're hiking. like, and you're like, why what? are you, like, <laughs> what are you doing, right? And then meanwhile, you're muddy and you have hiking boots on. And then when I went there, a lot of like of their more popular hikes are paved, so you can like look a little bit nicer. And I was like, oh, that makes sense in that way. But a lot of the food, um, like mochi, uh, mochi ice cream, uh, ramen, and it's um, and saimin as well. And it was like, oh, okay, okay, I t I start to get it. From, yeah. Um, yeah. And there was one point I was getting a little nostalgic that there was actually an eggs and things in Kyoto. So I went to eggs and things and just had like Kona coffee and like eggs Benedict, and it was so well, that's, nice. That's another really big mm -hmm. question I want to ask you. you know, <clears throat> American influence is you know, must be ubiquitous in Japan. Mm -hmm. You must see a McDonald's on every street corner. <laughs> is, did you? I mean, yeah. did you feel that there was a big American presence? Um, in terms of those chain stores, yes, but not so much the like America of it. And I have to admit that like Starbucks and 7-Eleven really like saved me. You know when you travel and you just get weary and you're dehydrated. Sometimes you just want a place that you feel like safe and you understand the routine, right? Um, and a lot of so for example in Starbucks they have bathrooms for guests. That doesn't exist in most other places in Japan. So I could always count on like, oh, if I've been walking for miles, if I find a Starbucks, I'm okay, right? And they also have 7-Eleven. So, you know, oh, I really don't feel like spending $15 on a full meal. Let me go get like a rice ball at 7-Eleven. Yeah. Um, and they had some others. They had this convenience store called like Lawson Station, and it's like from Ohio. I've never even heard of it. And I was like, "What? Like, what is this?" It was just like, it was just like Seven Eleven, but like teenage boys loved it for some reason. Would loiter outside all the time. But uh, yeah, it, there were a lot of American chains. Um, I I always thought when Japanese tourists come here for shopping, I was like, we must have like much better shopping than anywhere in Japan, and that's so not true. Jay, why don't you turn your phone off? You're too busy of a guy. Too busy listening. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, while I was there, like, one small neighborhood of, like, Osaka had more shopping than, like, all of Hawaii together, and I was like, wow, but I think, I think um, in terms, like, of an American imprint, it's there, but you don't get this sense of, like, it's America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Well, it's, it's integrated somehow. Yeah, it's integrated. And bathrooms? They got bathrooms in Japan, because we don't have bathrooms here in Hawaii, and I wonder <laughs> if you felt there was a luxury involved in finding bathrooms in Japan. Um, well, their bathrooms are amazing. I have now spoiled, like, the bidets and all that kind of stuff. The heated seat, the heated seats are hard to get used to because I would, like, sit down and be like, ew, this is like someone else's heat. I don't like this. It's disgusting. And then I realized, like, oh, this is, like, quite luxurious, and they have whole control panels and stuff. Like, I was shocked. So cool. I, I was like, okay, that's technological advancement in some form, I guess. So... Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, we only have a minute left, is, uh, <clears throat> is about the, the school children. Mm -hmm. My recollection, <clears throat> it's years ago, 
is that there were school children everywhere in mm -hmm. Japan, and they traveled in groups, you yeah. know, sort of preparing to come to Hawaii with a right. flag out there. Yeah. And, and they're the cutest possible they kids. They're the you cutest could... children in the world. <laughs> yes. They are. I was... I'm not a huge kid person, and when I saw them, my heart was melting. Um, what I did notice was that they could travel on their own. I would see six-year-olds like walking downtown, getting on a bus by themselves it's safe. because it's safe, right? Yeah. They they get on the train, they get on the subway by themselves, and I was I, I almost wanted to be like, "Are you lost? Like, are you okay?" And they're like, "Know everything better than I do." Um, so I was really impressed by the independence of children there. Um, and they were just adorable. They all have like identical suits and like little hats on and um, yeah. Yeah, great. So what's your favorite thing that you come away with? I'm, I'm very interested if you could pick yeah. the one thing that left the biggest impression on you that you bring back, you know, now incorporated in your worldview. The warmth that was extended to me by Japanese people. Um, I thought they'd let me do my own thing. Instead, they would invite me into their homes, take me out to eat. That was just an amazing time. And I think I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a colder, more tech culture, mm. I guess. And the fact that, you know, they're human, just like us, and they want us to all have a good time. Uh, okay, as we go out, I'd like to play the picture that we didn't get to see, and that's the, the bullet train. I wonder, oh, the I wonder if we can find the picture of the bullet train. Yeah, the video. Man. That would that would be what I would like to leave me there. Well, that's the station. Yeah. So it's, it's, okay. It's a video that's the bullet train station. Yep. It looks so modest. And oh, it's a clip. Look at that. Oh my Isn't that goodness. That's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have that here someday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Thank Mark. you. Too. It's great to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a wonderful trip. Wonderful. Oh, Thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs>